نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي رب زدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما امين ثم امين so the first principle of tafsir that we are going to do today is the tafsir of the quran by the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says afala yatadabbaruna al qur'ana walaw kana min indi ghayri allah lawajaduhu fihi ikhtilafan kathira so they do they do not ponder over the quran for indeed had it been for other than allah they would surely have found many contradictions in it and when you study the quran you realize that uh not only there is no contradiction in it rather one part of the quran explains the other part so this is the most authentic and the most uh the, the best of the kind of tafsir uh, that is done for example quran explain itself allah subhanahu wa taala says was samaa'i wat tariq wa ma adraaka mat tariq an najm al thaqib by the heavens and the tariq and what will you uh, make you know what the tariq is it is the star of piercing brightness so in the third ayah allah subhanahu wa taala himself has described and given the tafsir of what the previous ayah means or the word tariq means then in other cases allah subhanahu wa taala refers to the detail of the verse in another part of the quran for example in surah fatiha allah says sirat alladhina an'amta alayhim the path of those whom you have favored and it is explained in uh, the fourth surah in ayah 69 wa may yuti'i allah wa rasulahu fa ulaika ma'a alladhina an'ama allah alayhim min an-nabiyyin was-siddiqin was-shuhada' was-salihin wa hasuna ulaika rafiqa and whoever obeys allah and his messenger they will be in the company of those whom allah has shown favor the prophets and the truthful followers and the martyrs and the pious and how excellent these companions are so therefore the second verse explains who those who whom you have favored are so this is basically uh, the tafsir of this verse the tafsir of the uh, an amta alayhim who are the people who were favored and this is done by allah subhanahu wa taala himself now in another place allah subhanahu wa taala mentions about adam the rep- repentance of, of adam alayhi salam in surah al baqara allah subhanahu wa taala says fatalaqa adam min rabbihi kalimatin fataba alayhi and then adam alayhi salam received from his lord words and he related relented towards him now everyone would be uh, you know thinking what are those words what are those words of repentance that allah subhanahu wa taala forgave this thing so in another place allah subhanahu wa taala mentions qala rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna minal khasirin they adam and eve said o oh lord we have wronged ourselves if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us we will be of those who are lost and this is explained in surah number 7 ayah 23 so this is the tafsir of the quran by the quran so who over here a dua that has been mentioned was later on described in detail by allah subhanahu wa taala and another was direct were other verses direct the reader to another passage in the quran or tell the reader that the subject has already been mentioned for example allah subhanahu wa taala says wa ala alladhina hadu haramna ma qasasna alayka min qabl and onto the jews we forbade them such foods that we have already mentioned to you before in other words these prohibitions have been elaborated upon elsewhere in the quran and that is surah number 6 ayah 146 so uh in another verse allah subhanahu wa taala also states uhillat lakum bahimatul an'ami illa ma yutla alaykum lawful to you for food are all the beasts of cattle except that which will be will have been recited to you after two verses the beasts that are forbidden are recited hurrimat alaykum al maytatu wa damu wa lahm al khinzir forbidden to you are all dead animals and blood and the flesh of pigs 
Now you see over here, included in the interpretation of the Quran with the Quran is the knowledge of Asbab and Nuzul, the knowledge of Makki and Madani verses, the Nas Nasikh and Mansukh verses, the various Qiraat, the knowledge of the different categories of verses, the Mahkam and Mutashabe, Aam and Khaz, Mutlaq and Muqayyid, the Mantuq and Mafhum, the Haqiqi and the Majazi and all other categories which were not discussed uh, in this book. So this is because a general ruling arm uh, in the verse might be specified khas in another verse and so forth. So in addition to all the different qiraat of a verse must be considered to arrive at a proper understanding of a verse. So all the relevant verses must be taken into account to form a complete picture as all the verses of the Quran complement one another. So now you understand that it is essential that every verse of the Quran be looked at in light of its sister verses. So no interpretation of any verse can contradict another verse. Okay? So now let's look at the tafsir by the sunnah. This is page number 305. Inshallah ta'ala you will see tafsir by sunnah. Uh, you can uh, start in... Uh, uh, you. Uh, this topic starts on page number 302. But I'm going to uh, look at uh, the, um, the details present in 305. Uh, just note down this page uh, because uh, it might help you in the uh, assignment also, page 305. Okay, so let's look into the topic. Um, it was the job of the Prophet ﷺ not only to convey the literal text of the Quran, he also had to convey its explanation, right? This we all know because... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told, the Quran, uh, told in the Quran wa anzalna ilayka dhikra li tubayyila lil nasi ma nuzzila ilayhim wa la'allahum yatafakkaroon and we have sent down to you Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the remembrance so that you may clearly explain to mankind what has been revealed to them and so that they may give thought mm -hmm. so they may ponder upon it and how will they be able to ponder upon it when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will give a detailed account of the ayahs and what they mean so uh, the first question that arises is that how much portion of the quran was explained by sunnah how much was it explained by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now the scholars of islam are divided into opinions with regard to this issue sheikh al islam ibn taymiyah was of the view that prophet sallallahu alaihi explained all of the quran whereas jalaluddin suyuti uh, claimed that prophet sallallahu only explained a portion of it right so uh, a suyuti only managed to find a few hundred narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi included, Wasallam, including weak and fabricated ones in which he, he uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, explicitly interpreted a verse. On the other hand, what Ibn Taymiyyah went, meant was that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi left us all the necessary knowledge needed in order to properly understand the Quran. As Aisha Radiallahu reported, the Prophet Sallallahu character embodied the Quran. Wakana khuluqul Quran. This is the saying of Aisha radiallahu, right? So therefore, even though there might not exist many explicit statements from the Prophet concerning tafsir, the Prophet did leave us with the information and methodology necessary for understanding the Quran, right? So it is clearly uh, something that uh, we must have iman in that Prophet didn't leave out any portion, right? Okay, so although uh, we, we can see this in the hadith and uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, shirk, right? In the shirk ala zulmun azim, when uh, this was mentioned in the Quran, Prophet ﷺ mentioned this fact when the Sahaba were worried that which amongst us uh, does not commit zulm, right? Because everybody was scared of this fact that we we mix our deeds with zulm also. But Prophet, it was Prophet Sallam who mentioned this hadith and this ayah. Through the ayah, he made this tafsir, right? So even Prophet Sallam himself would sometimes use the Quran as a tafsir and give the Quran Quranic tafsir to the Sahaba. Also, it is said that uh, and hell will be brought that day the hadith described describes how it will be brought and a hadith 
in prophet is, is a prophet is uh, giving a detailed account on how that thing will happen right in an ex another example penalty prescribed for thief is as for the thief male or female cut off his hand this is surah number 5 ayah 38 so the sunnah of the prophet sallam explains that the thief's hand is only to be cut off if he steals above a certain monetary value and that in such a case the right hand is to be cut off from the wrist joint so this is how prophet sallam does the tafsir of the ayah he explains it even further as how to implement it so from these and other examples, it is possible to say the Prophet ﷺ explained the Quran in the following manners. Number one, by his implementation of general or vague commands, for example, the Quran orders the believers to pray and perform hajj. The Prophet ﷺ, by his actions and statements showed the believers the exact procedure and timings of prayer and the specific rules of hajj, right? Number two, by explaining unclear concepts in the verse. For example, the verse commanding the believers to begin their fast, when the white thread becomes clear from the black thread, was explained by the Prophet as being the streaks of light in the sky after dawn. As you must have remembered that, remembered that for this ayah, once a Sahabi, he wanted to fast and he put two threads, one black and white under his pillow, and he slept, and he came to the prophet next morning that I was waiting for them to separate, right? So it, the, even the Sahaba could, could misinterpret different ayahs that Prophet ﷺ then explained in detail. Number three, by specifying the exact connotation of a word or phrase, the example in which the Prophet ﷺ specified that the injustice referred to in um, ayah number six, uh, sorry, Surah number 6, Ayah 82, was shirk falls in this category. Where Prophet Sallallahu tells that uh, over here, Dhul means shirk. Number 4 is by constraining a general ruling or verse. The example of the specification of thief and hand by the Prophet Sallallahu was given above. Number 5, by generalizing a specific ruling or verse, an example of this is when some companions came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him concerning the verse, And if you travel through the land, there is no sin upon you if you shorten your prayers, if you fear that those who disbelieve may harm you. The companions could not understand why Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims were still shortening their prayers, during travel, despite the fact that there was no longer any fear for from the enemy attacks. So the Prophet ﷺ responded, the concession to shorten prayers, even in a state of security, is a charity which Allah has given you, therefore accept the charity. So here, uh, the Sahaba did not fully understand uh, the, the, the places where this ayah to shorten the prayer, uh, the where it is going to be implemented, what are the events and they thought that it is only during war or during times of unrest and when you're in a fear of being attacked. But Prophet ﷺ then explained that this is a general ruling for traveling. Number six, by explaining the intent of a verse, the example of which the Prophet ﷺ explained, uh, those whom you are angry with and those you are uh, those who are astray, they it, it was the Prophet who said that this is ayah is concerning the Jews and the Christians. So the Jews and the Christians fall under this particular category. category. Seventh is by adding extra commands or prohibitions to the verse. An example of this is the Prophet's prohibition of joining a woman with her maternal or paternal aunt in marriage as co-wives, whereas the Quran only prohibits, prohibits combining a woman with her sister. Now, Prophet ﷺ has given a detailed uh, law now, right? Prophet, uh, the, the law mentioned in the Quran was a general ruling that a man cannot marry his wife's sister. So two sisters cannot be co-wives. But Prophet ﷺ gave a detailed law. Uh, what was that? It was that even the aunts, uh, paternal and maternal, like Puppi and Khala, they cannot e be joined in marriage e either. 
Number eight, by emphasizing the meaning of the verse, in other words, by practicing and affirming the laws in the Quran. For example, all hadith stressing good treatment to wives merely affirm the verse, bil ma'ruf, and live with them on good terms and kindness, right? So this is how Prophet Sassan was implementing this verse. So if you look into the Sunnah, how Prophet Sassan treated his wives, you will learn what Ashiruhunna bil ma'ruf means. Hmm? So how he compliments them, how he shows his affection, how he shows that he loves them, and how he protects them and uh, fulfills their needs, and all of those things that he does, and then, you know, having separate time uh, for his wives to give uh, the sermons and teach them about deen, all of those things are considered uh, a tafsir of ashiru hunna bil maruf. Number nine, by showing that the verse was abrogated. This category has already been discussed in the previous chapter. So these few examples should, uh, sufficient, should be sufficient to illustrate that the Sunnah is of equal importance to the Quran in deriving laws and understanding the Quran. The Quran can never be understood properly without the Sunnah. Even the companions whose knowledge of the Arabic language was unparalleled had difficulty understanding many verses until the Prophet cleared up the exact meaning of them. Okay. The Third is tafsir by the statements of the companions. So after the Quran and Sunnah, the next most important source of understanding the Quran is the understanding of the companions. The statements of the companions are taken as a fundamental source of tafsir for the following reasons. Number one, the primary reason is that the companions are a generation that was chosen by Allah to accompany the Prophet ﷺ and to pass on the religion and teachings of Islam to later generations. Their character and religious knowledge has been testified by Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. For Allah says in the Quran, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Walladina ma'ahu ashiddau ala al kuffari wa ruhamau baynahum. Tarahum rukkaan sujjadan. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him, that is the companions are severe against the disbelievers and merciful amongst the, themselves. You see them bowing and falling down in prostration, seeking the bounty of Allah and his pleasure. In more than one verse of the Quran, Allah mentions the fact of the Allah anhum He is well pleased with them and they are with him. So this clearly shows the superiority of uh, superiority of the companions over the gen other generations. And the Prophet says, the best of all mankind are my companions, then those that will follow them, and then those that will follow them. Now, the second uh, reason is that the companions actually witnessed the revelation of the Quran. Many of its verses were revealed to cater to the problems that had risen amongst them. As such, they were familiar with the Asbab and Nuzul, with the Makki Madani verses, and with the Nasikh and Mansur, and did not need to go searching for this knowledge, as later generations would have to do. The number three, the Quran was revealed in the Arabic and the companion spoke that language. Therefore, many words and phrases that later generation had difficulty understanding were clear to the companions. The fourth is that the companions were the most knowledgeable of generations with regards to pre-Islamic customs. Therefore, they understood the references of the Quran to such customs, right? So all of these things show that the companions were basically a very, very important source for the tafsir of the Quran. Now, Az-Zarqashi summarized this point when he said, as for the interpretation of the companions, it is investigated into if this interpretation was based upon language, then they are the scholars of the language. And there is no doubt that they should be given credence in this interpretation. If this interpretation relies upon what they saw of Asbab and Nuzul or other circumstances that is of pre-Islamic uh, customs, then again, there is no doubt concerning this type of interpretation. So all of these interpretations that the you know, Sahaba ha ha have been doing and they have detailed the, uh, the seer of the Quran, that is a very, very authentic and clear source and that must be taken into account when the tafsir is being done. 
So after the interpretation of the Quran by itself and by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions relied upon four primary sources to interpret the Quran. Number one, their knowledge of Arabic language, rhetoric, grammar, and pre-Islamic poetry. Number two, their knowledge of the pre-Islamic customs of the Arabs. Number three, their knowledge of the habits of the Jews and Christians at the time of the revelation of the Quran. And number four, their personal reasoning and their keen intellect, which of course was based upon knowledge. And even Prophet Sallallahu as you know, uh, used to do dua for the Sahaba, for them to understand the Quran, and he used to test them uh, occasionally also. So, uh, Qatada said about this, that there is not a single verse in the Quran except that I have heard something concerning it, right? So this is tafsir by the statement of the successors, the Tabi'een. Mujahid said, I recited the Quran to Ibn Abbas three times. In each recitation, I stopped at every verse, asking him concerning its interpretation. This is why Sufyan Authority said, when you hear an interpretation from Mujahid, this should be sufficient for you. So there are Tabi'een who were directly uh, studying the Quran by, from the Sahaba and uh, you know, their tafsir was the most authentic of all. Other scholars who have rejected this view, they claim that an interpretation of a successor could not have originated from the Prophet as could the interpretation of a companion since they never saw the Prophet Also, they did not witness the revelation as did the generation before them and their trust to worthiness is not guaranteed, guaranteed specifically for every one of their generation, unlike the companions. So in other words, some, are, some scholars, they do not uh, agree to the fact that the successes uh, uh, tafsir could be on that level uh, equaling the tafsir of the companions. Therefore, the correct view in this matter, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, is that if the successors give the same interpretation to a verse, then their interpretation must be accepted. But if they differed among themselves, then the opinion of one group will have no authority over the other, nor over the generations after them. In such cases, one must resort to the Quran and Sunnah, the companions and the Arabic language in order to obtain the correct interpretation. Now, here you have a clear ruling that when there are two successors, two tabi'in who are giving a tafsir of the single ayah, but completely differently, and they are giving different statements about the same ayah, then you will take the tafsir of the companions and the tafsir of the sunnah and the Quran by the Quran. Then you will not take that tafsir because the successors have a difference of opinion regarding that. Okay, so the fourth is tafsir by Quran language and classical poetry, Arabic language and classical poetry. So this topic in reality has two topics, tafsir by the Arabic language, tafsir by the classical poetry. The relationship of the understanding of the Quran to knowledge of Arabic language is clear. It is important to truly understand and interpret, it, interpret Quran without, sorry, it is impossible to truly understand Quran and interpret it without knowledge of the Arabic language, since the Quran refers to it having been revealed in a clear Arabic tongue. We have sent down to you an Arabic Quran so that you may understand. So the interpretation of the Quran must comply with the rules of Arabic language in terms of vocabulary, grammar, rhetoric, and principles of disclosure. Imam Ibn Malik said, if any person is brought to me having interpreted the Quran while he is ignorant of the Arabic language, I will make an example of him by punishing him. The famous successors and student of Ibn Abbas Mujahid said, it is impermissible for any person who believes in Allah in the last day to speak concerning the book of Allah if he is not knowledgeable of the dialects of the Arabs. This means that he must know the seven ahruf of the Quran if he wants to do tafsir of, or if he wants to give his own opinion about verses or if he wants to give explanations. Imam al shatubi underlined this principle clearly when he said, whoever desires to understand the Quran, then it will be understood from the speech of the Arabs and there is no way other than this. So for you to understand the Quran, 
all the scholars they are agreeing to this fact that you must know arabic language learning the translation of the quran learning just you know reading the urdu tafsir of the quran would not make anyone a scholar of the quran one must know the arabic language to know the quran to understand it imam al qurtubi warns in the in the introduction to his tafsir against this is what he says rushing to interpret the quran by the apparent arabic wording without researching into its strange and obscure words its interchangeable phrases and into the characteristics of second speech deletion and ellipsis whoever rushes to extract meanings based on the apparent arabic meanings his errors are frequent and he enters into the realm of those who interpret the quran solely for with their intellects so this is a clear uh, saying of imam al qurtubi that states that one has to have detailed knowledge of arabic language before he indulges into the understanding of the quran or uh, if he wants to give its meanings for example the phrasing of a verse might be general whereas its context shows that it is specific in other cases words or even phrases might appear missing yet this is a characteristic of eloquent arabic since the missing words are understood by context so one would know what the word comes here what is the word that needs to be fitted here for the for the verse to uh, to be understandable right this is because allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam are most knowledgeable of what they wish to express than later scholars of the language are likewise the knowledge of the companions is greater than the knowledge of any letter later linguist or grammarian therefore the status of interpreting the quran based on arabic language comes after these three sources and cannot supersede them to give an example of an interpretation that is based on arabic yet contradicts something stronger than it the scholar abu baida al muatazili said concerning the verse wa yunzilu alaykum min as sama ima an li yutahhirakum bi wa yuzhibu wa yuzhiba ankum rijs al shaytan wa li yarbita ala qulubikum wa yuthabbita bihi al aqdam and he caused rain to descend on you from the sky to clean you thereby and to remove you remove from you the whisperings of shaitan and to strengthen your hearts and make you feet your feet firm thereby so this verse is majaz and it means that allah sent down patience upon the companions so that they would be firm against the enemies this interpretation although perhaps acceptable from a linguistical point of view contradicts authentic narrations which show that the verse is to be taken in a haqiqi manner that it actually rained on the companions and that this rain caused the desert sand to become firm and thus made it easy for companions to walk at tabri commenting on the view of abu baida said and this opinion goes against all the scholars of tafsir from the companions and successors and it is sufficient evidence that an opinion is mistaken when it contradicts those whom he we have mentioned now you see here that he took the mijazi uh, aspect right and he just said that this means that they were they were given patience and they became firm against their enemies rather this was a haqiqi event that took place in its actual form that uh, that the, the army of the muslims they had rain that was sent among uh, uh, on top of them right and it it made that Uh, the the sand firm and they were uh, they could easily walk on that right so now you understand this so uh, so yes this is it inshallah um okay uh tafsir by classical poetry now the question arises is poetry prohibited because allah subhanahu wa taala says in the quran wash shu'ara yattabi'uhum al-ghawun 
as for the poets only the misguided follow them do you not see that they speak about every matter in their poetry and that they say what they do not practice except those poets who believe and do righteous deeds and frequently remember allah so the prophet sallam also spoke against this type of poetry for he sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is better for a man's chest to be filled with pus than to be filled with poetry this hadith has been understood to refer to the poet who becomes excessively involved in his poetry so much so that it fills his chest and turns him away from the remembrance of allah and the quran therefore poetry in and of itself is not prohibited in the quran or sunna it is only evil and excessive poetry that is uh, not allowed in fact the prophet sallam stated indeed some poetry has great wisdom in it it might be asked how can we interpret the quran the speech of allah by poetry which is the speech of men now an example uh, your book gives a lot of different examples one of the examples i would like to quote to you is when umar radhi allah once was with the other companions in a gathering and he asked them the meaning of the verse aw ya'khudhum ala takhawf or he will take them upon takhawf at this an old man from the tribe of hudayl stood up and said this is from her our dialect takhawf means attrition suffering loss little by little umar asked him is this something that the arabs know from the po- their poetry he asked yes and recited to them the line of poetry what was the line of poetry that he recited this was the line the translation of it is her saddle the khawf abraded from a long and high hump as when a piece of skin used for smoothing arrows has the khawf from the back of the tr- a tree at this umar said stick to the recordings and you will not be misled when asked what are the recordings he replied the poetry of pre islamic times therein is the explanation of your book and the meaning of your words so you see an old man who might not have been well versed in the quran but he knew the pre islamic poetry he understood the use of the word he understood the use of that word where is that word used how it is used you see because uh, kabhi uh, agar aap meaning uh, aap you know many of you have might have children and sometimes they come up to us and they ask that ammi ammi what is the meaning of this word right and it's a new word and we ask them cha is ye kis sentence mein use hua you know the book that you're reading can you recite the read out the sentence in which this particular word is used and they read out this the sentence and you automatic automatically get the meaning and the, you tell the meaning okay this is the meaning of this word because a word might be used in different meanings right same word so over here umar radhi allah asked that man as to where this word has been used in the poetry and then he understood the actual meaning of the word now uh at uh, as a suyuti in his itqan quotes a lengthy account between one of the leaders of the khawarij Nafi ibn Azraq and Ibn Abbas Nafi once passed by Ibn Abbas while he was interpreting the Quran to those around him Nafi said to his companion come let us go to this person who is pretending to interpret the Quran even though he has no knowledge concerning it they went to Ibn Abbas in order to try to outwit him and asked him we wish to ask you concerning the book of allah and we want you to explain it to us and bring us proofs from the arabic language for your statements for verily allah has revealed the quran in a clear arabic tongue ibn abbas told them ask me whatever you wish so they asked him tell us the meaning of the word la raiba fi there is no raib in it ibn abbas responded this means there is no doubt in it they asked do the arabs know this meaning he replied yes have you not learned the line by ibn zabari and this line is o umma there is no raib concerning the truth there is only raib concerning what a liar is nafi then proceeded to ask ibn abbas the interpretation of a further 189 verses in each case trying to show that ibn abbas was ignorant of the meaning of the verse however for every obscure phrase in each verse ibn abbas was able to explain its proper meaning and quote a line of classical poetry to prove this meaning 
in this incident not only is the necessity of knowledge knowing arabic poetry to interpret the quran shown but also the superiority of the knowledge of the companions over that of any other generation now you understand why classical arabic was needed to understand the quran because classical arabic provided the sentences and the usage of those phrases that were present in the quran now what is the criteria hmm what is the criteria uh, that you can use in the the poetry of the poetry that you can use number one pre islamic poets meaning those who died before the advent of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam examples of this category in, uh, include imri al qais al aishi and an nabigha right so they have their own diwans they have uh, uh, full books contemporary poets meaning those who were alive when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam announced his prophethood example in this category include labid and the famous famous companion hassan ibn thabit right there is also diwan abu bakr also early poets meaning those the third is early poets meaning those who appeared after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but still relatively early in islamic history examples in this category are jari jarir and uh, farazak right uh even now you will know that uh, there is a book muallaqat there, there was a book known as diwan abu bakr also as siddiq there is a uh, poetry muallaqat these muallaqat means to hang so this poetry was so famous that they were hang, hung inside of the kaaba so there was this high level given to the poetry by the arabs uh so is it so you must remember that it cannot be disregarded completely you cannot say that oh you know i don't need to uh know this and uh, this is something for a, a mufassir to become a mufassir one has to know all of these um texts also number 5th is tafsir by the pre-islamic arab customs now all the arab customs like marriage zihar mahar divorce all of these different customs were there in the arabs and to understand quran uh, you must know right uh, how it was interpreted in the pre-islamic times So in a verse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "In Qiftum, Allah Tuqsitu fil Yatama, Fankihu ma Taba lakum min Anisa, Imatna wa Thulata wa Ruba." And if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with female orphans under your care, then marry women of your choice, two, three, or four. Urwa ibn Zubair could not understand the relationship of taking care of orphans with marrying other women. He went to his aunt Aisha to ask her to clear up this confusion. She replied, "Oh my nephew, this verse is referring to the orphan girl who is in the care of her guardian, and he is attracted by her beauty and wealth. He wishes to marry her without paying her the dowry that she deserves. So this verse prohibited them, the guardians, from marrying them, the orphans, if they did not think that they would be able to deal justly with the these girls in their dowry, but instead to marry other free women." In this incident, Aisha Radhi Allah's knowledge of pre-Islamic customs allowed her to understand the intent of this word. That why often girls are being linked to the men being the men who are taking care of them, marrying other women. Okay, now comes the point of tafsir by Judeo-Christian narrations. So there are hadiths related to the Israeli Israeli. Uh, Israeliyat. The Prophet Sallam said, "Spread knowledge from me, even if it is a sentence that is a verse of the Quran or hadith of the Prophet Sallam, and narrated from the children of Israel without hesitation. But whoever intentionally forges a lie upon me, then let him prepare his place of residence in hell." In this hadith, it appears that all Israeliyat narrations can be accepted. In another hadith, it is reported that Umar, uh, Rabi Allah, once came to the Prophet Sallam with a copy of the Torah. The Prophet Sallam asked him, "What is this, Umar?" He replied, "It is a book that I had copied so that I can add to my present knowledge, more knowledge." At this, Prophet Sallam became so angry that his cheeks appeared flushed, and he immediately ordered all the companions to be called to the masjid. 
he sallallahu alaihi wasallam then stood up and said o oh people verily i have been given the most concise and precise of speech and i have come up to you with knowledge that is pure therefore do not be misled i swear by him in whose hands is my life when musa were musa alive right now he would have no opin option but to follow me in this narration the prophetism appears to be strongly prohibiting even reading israiliyat narration the third of these dealing with this subject mentions that the jews would read the torah in hebrew and then explain it to the muslims in arabic the prophet sallam remarked do not believe the people of the book nor disbelieve them but rather say we believe in allah and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you in this narration prophet sallam told the muslims that they were not allowed to believe in such narrations nor could they deny their truthfulness but could only affirm that allah had sent down revelations to both communities in combining these three narrations the following conclusions may be reached it is permissible to quote israiliyat as long as these narrations do not contradict any verses of the quran or hadith of the prophet sallam however such narrations cannot be used as a source of knowledge as their authenticity is unknown rather muslims cannot outrightly deny their authenticity nor can they convincingly affirm them right So Ibn Taymiyyah, in summarizing the potential usefulness of his Raiyat comments, they may be quoted as the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ permits it. But let us note that most of them have no value whatsoever so far as religious mat matters are concerned, because we cannot draw fatwa from them, right? We cannot take religious laws from them. Okay. So the last is tafsir based on subjective opinion, Rai. The last source of tafsir is tafsir by subjective opinion, commonly known as, uh, known in Arabic as rai. In other words, a scholar uses his potential opinion ijtihad to arrive at an interpretation of a verse, and this is called tafsir with rai. Now, the proof that rai based upon knowledge is not prohibited are many, and including this, the first is. <laughs> Number one, the words "afala yata daburun al Qur'ana am ala kulubin akfaluha." Do they not reflect and ponder over the Qur'an, or are there locks on their hearts that prevent them from understanding it? This verse asks mankind to ponder and reflect over the Qur'an, which shows that there are meanings, interpretations that are to be obtained only after contemplation. The seer with Ray. Ray. Number two is the verse "Kitabun anzalna hu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati wa liyadakkara ulul alba." This is a book that we have sent down to you, full of blessings, so that they may ponder over its verses and that men of understanding may remember. Once again, the believers are told to ponder over its verses. Now, the third is the verse "Bala radu hu ila rasuli wa ila ulil amri minhum la alima hu ladina yastam bituna hu min." if they had only referred it back to the messenger or to those whose authority amongst them of in authority amongst them then those who are qualified to extract interpretations or rulings would have known it now in the fourth the prayer to that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made for ibn abbas o oh allah grant him interpretation shows that there are meanings of the quran that are not obvious to everyone and that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed that ibn abbas be given this knowledge uh allahumma faqihu fi din he had asked for the companions and those after them all interpreted the quran with more than just narrations and this proves that tafsir based upon rai is allowed for example when abu bakar was asked concerning the case of kalala mentioned in verse uh, 177 176 of surah 4 he replied i say with my rai so if it is correct it is from allah and if it is incorrect it is from myself and shaitan this shows that abu bakar interpreted the quran based on rai sixth is the fact that ijtihad is a part of this religion and with it any uh, stagnation that might have existed is removed from the religion the seer with rai is one type of ijtihad thus allowed so uh the proofs that rai based upon desires is prohibited now the how will you uh, how is anyone going to do tafsir uh, using rai when there are no desires 
personal desires attached to it. So Allah says, say, my Lord has only prohibited evil deeds, the apparent and hidden of them, and that you concern, you say concerning Allah that which you do not know them. Hmm? That you cannot say something that you, this Allah has said, and you don't know about it. You don't have knowledge about it. Even the verse that Allah says, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ And do not follow that which you do not have knowledge of. They, these verses discourage uh, speaking without knowledge and included in this is rai that is not based upon knowledge. The many narrations that exist from the self that show uh, their caution in interpreting the Quran without any knowledge. Perhaps the most famous quote is that of Abu Bakr who said, what earth would give me support and what sky would shelter me if I said concerning the book of Allah what I do not know. So the ab of evidences prove that Rai is divided into two types. Rai that is praiseworthy and Rai that is blameworthy. Now where is Rai used? Right? So number one you have to know that Rai is the weakest source of tafsir and it must be rejected whenever it is coming from someone who does not have the knowledge, right? Some scholars have classified the areas of Rai might be used as follows. Number one, to uncover meanings in a verse that conform, conform with Arabic and the Quran, right? To discover certain hidden aspects of the Quran within the realm of human limit. An example of this is when a certain linguist sees why one phrase or word has been used in a certain context over its synonyms. Number three, to see the goal of certain verses and understand their perspectives. An example of this is when a scholar puts forth a certain relationship between a set of verses. Number four, to extract and elaborate the morals that are to be gained from Quranic stories. Number five, to demonstrate the literary ijaz of the Quran. Because when you talk about the ijaz of the Quran, this is basically the rai of the person who is experiencing that ijaz, right? So you will understand that it, uh, it is, um, you know, it's not something that you can say two plus two is four. And this is not something that you can uh, conclude upon. And it was not going to be something black and white, right? So whoever fears Allah with the knowledge he knows, Allah will bless him with the knowledge of that which he does not know, right? And this is a beautiful thing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ So fear Allah and Allah will teach you. So when a person has fear of Allah, only then he can come up with that rai. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach him the hidden meanings that are there in the ayat. Imam Shafi'i says, it is impermissible for any person to give verdicts concerning the religion of Allah unless he knows he is knowledgeable of the book of Allah. It's nasikh and mansukh, it's muhkam and mutashabi, it's interpretation and the process of revelation. If it is makki, madani, and it's asbab and nuzul. So from this, we would... Uh, see what are the qualifications of a mufassir how who is the person who is qualified to do tafsir so a suyuti in his eighth khan lists 15 characteristics number one his intentions must be uh, proper he ha should have good in intentions number two it they he should be on the correct aqida the beliefs because you know that there were many deviant sects and they gave their own tafsirs based on their wrong aqaid so that sort of tafsir is not allowed. The aqidah should be correct. Number three, to be free from practicing or believing in innovations. A person should not be involved in bid'ah. Whoever is the mufassir must not be involved in bid'at. Number four, repentance and a pious heart. A person must be constantly repenting. Number five, a thorough and proper understanding of the fundamentals of religion, that is aqidah. Number six, follow a proper methodology of tafsir. Number seven, knowledge of the Arabic language and its vocabulary. Then he should have knowledge about the Arabic grammar, Arabic morphology, basis of Arabic words and word structures. He should have knowledge of Arabic rhetoric, elegance and manner of oratory. He should have knowledge of all the qiraats. He should know the principles of fiqh. 
he should have knowledge of fiqh itself so that he is aware of the various interpretations of the verses pertaining to the laws. 15, he should now have knowledge of asbab and nuzul and all the related sciences. He should have knowledge of nasikh and mansukh. He should have knowledge of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in particular those related to the interpretation of the Quran. He should have the knowledge of all the other branches of Ulum al-Quran, including Makki, Madani, Muhkam, Mutashabe, and types of Hijaz al-Quran also. And number 19, that he must have the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a divine endowment that it is not possible to obtain by oneself. This is a type of gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to whomever he chose, chooses. This type of intellect was what the Prophet ﷺ prayed for when he prayed for Ibn Abbas. Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah grant him an understanding and of interpretation. Right? So this basically concludes our, our class for today. And uh, I would give you... Uh, uh, some self-reading also that we will discuss inshallah ta'ala tomorrow so uh, the types of tafsir kindly do this self-reading this is from page number 326 from page number 326 till uh, the end of the chapter and uh, you can look into this inshallah ta'ala in detail because uh, this has different types of tafsir inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we will have uh, a detailed discussion on this also okay so inshallah um, tomorrow we will be answering different questions and whatever you have on your mind jazakallah khairan kaseera subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh